hi, everybody. I'd um, like to extend a very warm welcome to you all to UDC Law's Conversations with Clinicians. My name is Lindsay Harris, and I'm honored to serve as the Associate Dean of Clinical and Experiential Programs here at UDC Law. I direct our Immigration and Human Rights Clinic. So this is our first event in the fall 2022 Conversations with Clinicians series. This is UDC Law Clinicians engaging in conversations with leaders in the experiential education field, early leaders in clinical legal education and at, at a school where every single one of our students takes a mandatory 10 to 14 credits of clinic and many take more than that to graduate. We really want to create a space where clinicians, experiential educators across the country can engage in topics of interest to our community and think through some of the most pressing issues around teaching and learning. So today, I am thrilled to introduce UDC Law's Youth Justice Clinic Director, Professor Salima Snow, who will be in conversation with Howard University Law School's Professor Dustin Hansford. So I won't share with you all the details in the bios, but I do think to kind of tee things up, it would be helpful to share with you just some of the highlights um, for Professor Snow and Hansford um, of these incredibly accomplished attorneys, scholars, and educators. So I will begin with Professor Snow. Professor Snow entered academia over 16, um, after over 16 years of practice in legal services in DC and Georgia. She currently directs the youth, UDC Law Youth Justice Clinic and teaches critical race theory. At its core, the Youth Justice Clinic seeks to improve the disparate outcomes for youth in the District of Columbia. The clinic recognizes the layers of, uh, of barriers that push youth into the juvenile system, including racism, adultification, uh, bias, edu education inequity, and housing instability. The clinic focuses on systemically ensuring youth voices are positively amplified, seen, and offered meaningful opportunities for success. So through a critical race theory lens, Professor Snow's scholarship focuses on youth justice, religious profiling, gender equ equity, and the intersection of poverty, gender, and access to justice. Professor Snow is the past president of the National Association of Muslim Lawyers and Karama, the Muslim Lawyer, Women's Lawyers for Human Rights. She currently serves on the ACLU's board, DC Board of Directors and is a faculty affiliate at Rutgers Center for Security, Race and Rights. So Professor Hansford is the director of the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center and professor of law at Howard University School of Law. He has served as a Democracy Project Fellow at Harvard University, a visiting professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center, and as an associate professor of law at St. Louis University. As a student at Georgetown, he actually founded uh, the Georgetown Journal of Law and Modern Critical Race Perspectives. He's clerked on the Sixth Circuit and earned a Fulbright to study Nelson Mandela's legal career. Professor Hansford is a leading scholar and activist in the areas of critical race theory, human rights, and law and social movements. He's a co-author of the forthcoming seventh edition of Race, Racism, and American Law. He has been involved in advocacy in the international arena, drafting the Human Rights Shadow Report following the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. He's testified before numerous bodies on policing and racial justice in the U.S. Uh, he's testified before numerous bodies on policing and racial justice in the United States. And in December 2021, Professor Hansford was elected to serve on the U.N. Permanent Forum on People of African Descent for the 2022 to 2024 term. So there's so much more we could say about each of uh, these folks who will be in conversation today, but I'm going to hand it over to Professor Snow to kick off this conversation and hoping that we'll get to hear a little bit more about how Professor Hansford arrived uh, where he is today. Thank you both so much for being with us. Thank you, um, Dean Harris, for the introduction and also for your vision to uh, develop this series. It's quite um, both exciting and enlightening for me and motivating to hear what other people are doing in the clinical space. And of course, I'm extremely excited, Professor Hansford, to be in conversation with you today. You are my UDC neighbor right across the street at Howard. Um, and it was quite the buzz when you joined Howard to direct the Thurgood Marshall Center, and of course, what you're doing now in your movement lawyering clinic. And I do want to make sure that my Howard alma mater really taught you the Howard culture. So I do have a quick quiz for you. Are you ready for my quick quiz? You ready? Of course. <clears throat> 
Okay. H U. You know. Okay. 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 <laughs> Professor, good job. Good job. Howard has done you well and <laughs> so. For about the next, I guess, 40, 50 minutes now, I do want to spend some time exploring the, really just dipping our toes into issues of racial justice, of social justice, of human rights, which is something that I think you are helping us to reframe when we begin to think about uh, police brutality and other issues related to racial justice. Um, and kind of look at that through an unapologetic lens, whatever that may mean to you. Um, but I want to start first with building upon the bio that Dean uh, Harris shared. I often say to my students and remind myself as well that law is a human experience um, and people's stories matter. So I would love to hear your story, your personal story that brought you not just to academia, but really specifically to doing the work that you're doing um, that takes you know many hours to do. Okay, well, first, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I see some familiar names in the audience. So, so hello to everybody. And, you know, I, I'm going to be, uh, you know, really, really brief in this, this brief background. You know, I, I was really uh, blessed to be in the space of, of uh, legal teaching. Uh, my, I, myself, I started as an activist. Um, I worked at an organization called the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement as a youth, maybe 20, 21 years old on police brutality issues. And when I first became a law professor, I was not a clinical law professor. I was a uh, teacher of torts, critical race theory, uh, constitutional law. But I was, I was teaching at St. Louis University where that's where I met Mae Quinn, who's in the audience. And um, there, um, you know, I was in the city when Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson, 2014. And I became much more involved in activism than I ever had been involved in before. As you remember, that was the start in many ways of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, <clears throat> so that involved uh, working with people who were organizing protests, helping to come up with legal strategies for political change. As you mentioned, I worked with Mike Brown's mother in uh, helping them make the case that police brutality is a human rights violation as opposed to only a civil rights violation. Uh, it was very fulfilling for me as someone who had always admired uh, Malcolm X, who had been making that argument since the 60s. And I know that for me, it became, it came to the point where I was doing so much work uh, in the streets, if you will. And, uh, you know, the classroom work that I was doing was, was in many ways so focused inside the ivory tower <clears throat> that I did want to find a way to merge the two. And that's, that's what led me to uh, dip my toe into the possibility of clinical teaching. Uh, in some ways it was a uh, full, full hardy move. Uh, I sort of felt like the students could in the clinic would then be simply just working along with me on my cases and advocacy. And I saw it in the beginning, I sort of saw them as just like extra hands. Little did I, I know that, you know, uh, clinical teaching has a lot more to do with skills teaching as opposed to, um, you know, simply doctrinal teaching. And there was, there was a lot of work, additional work necessary for oversight and for teaching skills to young people uh, who are going to make mistakes because they're just learning. And so uh, there was, uh, you know, much a big learning curve for me. I'm now in my fifth year teaching uh, in a clinical setting. I teach a movement lawyering clinic, which does allow me to do many of the same things that I was doing in the streets of Ferguson. I'm, I still work with Mike Brown's mother. We recently introduced a bill uh, that will provide $100 million in mental health resources to families of those impacted by police violence. Um, with, with Congresswoman Cori Bush, we work on cases involving reparations. Uh, we work to support campaigns to end solitary confinement, um, juvenile justice issues. So we have a number of things that we do that I still consider core to my activism. However, I do, I do have a, a better understanding of the, the the work of, of the clinical teacher now than I did five years ago, much more so an emphasis on 
uh, the, the learning of the students, as well as balancing uh, trying to support activist outcomes. So it's been a journey, but I'm, I'm glad to have been able to be, be able to experience that for the last five years. So how do you or do you merge the work that you're doing in the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center with the work you're doing with students in the Movement Lawyer Clinic? It ends up being the same projects. Mm -hmm. This Thurgood Marshall Center has uh, uh, two or three staff people. And we have um, uh, essentially the way, the way that I like to describe it, uh, we have uh, the same mission of trying to use what I call our, head, our heads, our hands, and our hearts for this work. So any project we do, for example, on reparations, as opposed to just just uh, lending a legal helping hand, we also uh, make sure to integrate any legal scholarship on reparations, especially critical race theory scholarship on reparations, sort of like the the head part. And, uh, you know, then, of course, the hard part is we try to make sure that we allow any grassroots organizations working on reparations issues to take the lead so that we are movement led as opposed to being clinic led or lawyerly led. So that's how we connect with the people on the ground. And then we still do our legal work in a movement lawyer sense. So uh, that's that's the ethic of the the uh, the center. And, and I tell people that the best way to think of it, the clinic is ultimately designed to teach students mm -hmm. skills, skill sets, particularly the skill of being a movement lawyer. The center is designed to change the world and to get work out the door that is excellent. Mm -hmm. the, the focus in the in the center is not teaching. It's actually getting work done. So what ends up happening oftentimes is students will be working on projects during the semester. Our emphasis is on making sure they have a, a uh, effective learning experience. And then sometimes if there's more to do on the project before it gets out the door, uh, in support of the campaign that we're working with, then at the center, we will help tie up those loose ends before projects are completed. The center works year round. The clinic obviously only works during semesters. But but in in, this, in essence, I think that the, we, we work on the same projects, as I said earlier, uh, you know, criminal legal system reform, reparations is one of our key areas police brutality issues, free speech, fighting against, fighting against the ban on critical race theory, fighting to end the school to prison pipeline. And this has been a blessing because these are all things that I'm very passionate about pursuing as a, um, as a human being. And the clinic has allowed me to be in community with young people who also share the same passion, who want to learn how to use their legal tools and legal skills to help these movements for human rights. And um, ultimately we work together to try to make whatever contributions we are able to make. So it's, it's, a, it's a great privilege to be able to do this work. I do wanna come back to uh, reparations in particular because you've done a lot in that area, but I also got stuck with your heads, hands and hearts. Right. Um, I had a relatively long flight not too long ago and I rewatched uh, Jess Mercy during the flight and I actually just recently mentioned to students in my clinic that what really struck me in that was, what was it that gave Brian Stevenson the courage to represent clients on death row? And I started thinking about the fear that prevents us from being unapologetic advocates. And, uh, I don't know, I would just kind of love to hear you talk about how head, hands, and hearts give us courage, or do they give us courage? Maybe I'm making assumptions about what you're saying, but it just really grabbed me when you said our head, hands, and hearts. Right. <clears throat> I mean, how do well, we become, how do we instill in students or ourselves to become fearless when it comes to this work? Well, I mean, personally, I, I would have to say, often start with faith. Hmm. Uh, I pray for courage. When I uh, first started this work in Ferguson, um, I think some of the work I did was gained attention for me being arrested while protesting. And 
at that time I was pre-tenure. Um, <clears throat> there was there was opposition in the city of St. Louis to people protesting for Mike Brown. So some people people did did say that it took courage to be involved in that in that work. And to be honest, at that time I was so passionate about that cause. I knew that it was a cause that I had been uh, prepared to do. I felt that it was something that was a vocation. I felt that I was even called to do that work. Still, I still do. So it really never occurred to me to, to uh, not pursue my vocation based on possible opposition or critique or even attack, whether that meant an arrest or being fired from a job. That it was really afterwards that people reminded me of the risks. But during the time I saw I was Look, it, it there goes your tenure, me. right? <laughs> right, exactly. And so, you know, there there are there are um I believe there are issues that people may be so passionate about. And oftentimes we find those issues, I think, by uh, doing the amount of reflection it need that it calls for to find deep within your own story or your own, you know, your own history or something inside yourself that moves you to work on particular issues. And if you focus on that uh, point of passion, mm -hmm. what drives you, then uh, those risks, as I said, oftentimes don't even cross your mind until after the fact. Real, real now, real courage to be honest, is knowing the risk and feeling the fear and then doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I don't know how to teach people that skill to the extent that I've ever done anything like that. I had to rely on uh, spiritual resources and faith that um, if you act based on principle, then in the principles of positive principle, supporting human rights, supporting uh, you know, the, the the hopes for people to live full lives, you have to believe that if you're acting on those positive principles, mm -hmm. then everything will turn out okay, you know, people will understand. I know when I was arrested, you know, my mother, you know, you know, was uh, at first she was upset, you know, I didn't raise you to go to jail and everything. But I, I, over time, she realized that, um, you know, this was an arrest. This wasn't like a you know, being arrested for some some armed robbery or something. This was something that was based on my principles. And so she respected it. And if I had gotten fired, if I had, you know, I did I did have some situations where, you know, there were risks uh, to my career because of that arrest and because of the, the uh, consequences of a conviction uh, for someone in, you know, the, the, um, you know, the workplace who may have a, a conviction on their record going forward. Also, as a member of the bar, uh, some people, you know, there's some concerns around being a member of a bar and practicing law within a, with an arrest or conviction. So there were definitely were things that were concerning, but I was not the only one who went through that. That's another point of um, encouragement, I think, for people who may be facing these types of challenges, faith, but also community. Uh, people like May Quinn, I, I keep mentioning her because I see her name, but you know there are people in St. Louis who also were taking the same risks, uh, if not more risks, oftentimes more risks. So, you know, I, I, it didn't feel as uh, as as lonely or isolating to take that risk because I was aware that I was part of a community that was doing so. And I, I see Messiah McDougal there. I was give him a shout out as well. Uh, so anyway, so I, I think that that question of solidarity, being in community with people who are fellow travel travelers, and um, you know, relying on your faith, whether it's Islam, uh, you know, whatever your faith may be, or even if if not a religious faith, you know, just the faith in the the idea that you're doing the right thing. Right, right. And you're following your convictions and you're doing it for the right reasons. You're doing it for the, for principle. So when, yeah. when I mean, I, I definitely wrote pray for courage, pray for courage, because yeah. I, I think it sends so many different messages. Even if we don't have a specific faith base, but the idea of praying for courage means you realize that there are repercussions for something you may be doing. Um, and you just pray for the courage, as you said, understanding that some things can happen, but I pray that I have enough courage to still do this because it's the right thing to do. 
you know, I, I self-identify uh, uh, probably the most dominant uh, aspect of my identity for me is being the mother of a black male son. Um, and he was actually ringing my phone as we were in this. And the mother of me was like, is everything okay? Mind you, he's 35. But I thought about in, in Just Mercy, um, the character who played Brian Stevenson's his mother, that she was so clung, clung to fear of having her son walk into the lion's den in Alabama. And it's a real fear, I think. It's um, the fear that Justice Sonia Sotomayor page that I can't turn, that she mentioned in her dissent in uh, Utah v. Strife, I believe it was, mm -hmm. that every black and brown parent gives their child the talk. So um, understanding that Fear, I think, is real, but I love this idea of, of thinking about how we have to, to kind of pray for fear. So I want to shift a little bit about into the work that you've been doing with uh, police violence and framing that as a human rights issue with the work you're doing with uh, the UN and just kind of thinking beyond. And also, if you want to share with us how Black Lives Matter movement or other movements have really allowed us to get some movement, albeit so little, on looking at police violence um, as a human rights issue. So we've we've come come so far since <clears throat> since Trayvon Martin and Mike Brown was killed. I want to say that first and foremost that we we had people activated around the country and around the world to understand more about what. Uh, what human rights, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, duties the the government has when it comes to interacting with us as as people, um, and you know what our human rights are. So I think that that we've come a long way. I um, so much advocacy was done by so many people on that issue. The when we went to the United Nations in 2014, we were there as part of the UN. Uh, uh, treaty review for the, the Convention Against Torture. So police brutality was seen as arbitrary violence against uh, citizens on the behalf of the state. And it was put in the same box as the torture that was taking place at Guantanamo and things of that nature. Since then, there has now been created a new mechanism at the UN specifically to talk about police uh, brutality that was created in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd. Also, in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd, uh, the UN created a UN permanent forum for people of African descent, basically a permanent seat at the table at the UN for people of African descent to advocate for uh, their issues as a diaspora. And congratulations yeah. to you for being on that. <clears throat> Thank you, yes. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm a participant on that. So we have we have uh, new new platforms to and, and more resources to delve deeper into these issues. At the end of the day, though, the point of having the 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 frame of seeing police brutality as a human rights issue was to get the global community, if not the UN itself, but people around the world to to get involved in trying to advocate for change on the issue. We have been trying to advocate for change on this issue for generations. You know, you read about James Baldwin mm -hmm. talking about in the 60s. I mean, of course, you know, we've this is this is, um, you know, a core aspect of American identity, to be to be honest, is state violence against black people. Right. So that to, to be able to open it up and have people around the world shine a light on it and uh, talk about the the stakes and the language of human rights is it's, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. It's not just about uh, some local policy preference. It's about giving people the right to live their lives with freedom and dignity. And uh, that change of language, that change of framing makes all the difference in the world because that allows people from around the world to support you, especially people from African nations who did help push for that new mechanism to be created at the UN, in part because people were starting to use that global human rights language to talk about police brutality, especially with the George Floyd situation, which became a global crisis. 
um, protests were happening, not just around the country, but around the world. So <clears throat> all of that advocacy is tied up together. And I think we can't forget that uh, political advocacy does not happen in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Trying to get a conviction for the killer of George Floyd was not just about people in Minnesota, it was not just about people in the United States, it was about people around the world training their eyes and ears on what was happening and demanding that justice be served. And we saw, we've seen in so many situations where justice was not served in those police killings. Uh, and people always ask, well, why, why was it different in the George Floyd case? It was because of the global focus and the, and the light that was shined on that case globally. That's the only reason. So we can't have that level of, um, of course, um, uh, visibility for every one of these police violence cases. So when we have these moments that are resonating with people, we have to set up systems that perhaps will, ch will change the way all of these cases are handled in the future. So I know we don't have time to really do any kind of deep or even probably superficial dive into um, some of the movement lowering issues that are happening in your clinic. But one thing I would like to, if I could continue the, the conversation about framing, how issues are being framed. And if in your clinic, you often have, whether you have an opportunity to, or you're very deliberate in, in working with students to frame issues differently, not from the normative frame that's based on standards that have oppressed marginalized communities for centuries, but how we begin to teach students or how you're beginning to, or if you are teaching students how to frame an issue, as you had said, keeping their, training their eyes and their ears. Definitely. We you know, when we think about, so when I think about movement lawyering, I always tell students movement lawyering involves for me two, two aspects. One, engaging in integrated advocacy. So going beyond simply litigating in the courtroom, but being an advocate in a holistic way and doing so for mobilized clients, which are clients who are in the midst of campaigns for, 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 for political change, if not for a particular bill or law, at least for some sort of uh, a political shift and hopefully for a structural change if hope if, if possible. So when I think about integrated advocacy, so two elements, <clears throat> mobilized client, a client, a client who's in a campaign, and also integrated advocacy for that client. Just not just going to court for the client, but doing advocacy in whatever way is helpful to the campaign, the client being the campaign. That integrated advocacy does involve changing the frame, but often the way the frame is changed is through uh, the use of uh, narrative and storytelling. Mm -hmm. When you're when you're advocating, whether inside or outside of the court, you're you're telling a story, and uh, to the extent to that to which you're aware of that, <laughs> and the extent to which that you study how, techniques and in, in being effective at the storytelling process the extent to which you acknowledge that there are some core uh, stereotypes that are in existence. Critical race theory teaches us, as you know, Professor, uh, that there are uh, stock narratives that can only be countered by counter narratives. So the extent to which you are deliberately uh, designing the stories you tell to counter entrenched uh, racial tropes, uh, the extent to which you are using those narratives in, the, in a way that appeals uh, to certain values in your audience. We, we, we study uh, Marshall Gantz and his, his framework of using public narrative as a tool to be able to uh, push people towards action, to push people to move forward in spite of um, you know, any sort of um, fear or any sort of um, you know, um, lack of urgency or any sort of um, uh, anxiety. So that so learn helping people to tell their stories, helping to tell the stories of directly impacted people in a way that is going to create action is part of the movement lawyers toolkit. Mm -hmm. to, and in any tool in our toolkit, we study those tools. We we take a class session or two to sit down and do and, and examine readings on those tools. Uh, we do homework to understand, you know, how those tools could apply in our particular 
projects and cases. So it's not just reading, um, you know, a, a pack a, a packet of, you know, documents, but we then try it out and see how it works and give each other critiques so that we can improve. So that, that's one of the pleasures of being in a clinical environment is uh, to, to learn not just by reading, but by doing. <clears throat> so for, for me, that's how we, that's how we engage in integrated advocacy is by um, helping each other to learn how to use all, the, all of the tools in our tool set, especially the tool of narrative. So one of the, um, I think often discussed and something that you work on and talk about and research and write about is addressing community harm and how, what kind of relief we can get for the community harm that Black people in this country in particular have experienced. Um, and I'd love to hear about the work you're doing when it comes to reparations. That's that, to me, that's the most exciting uh, thing that's happening in racial justice today. The rise of the reparations lens. Um, just to be blunt, I think that the police reform, police abolition discussion uh, on a nationwide scale has really gotten stuck. And, uh, you know, we, you know, this been tied up with narratives around crime that have led to backtracking. But on the question of reparations, I think that's, that's a, there's a forward, forward momentum there that's almost overwhelming. We were able to help with the city of Evanston's reparation package. Some people may not be aware there is a city in the United States, Evanston, Illinois, in the suburbs of Chicago that has passed a reparations ordinance and has, give, has already given money to people for reparations. This would be reparations not for enslavement, but for um, uh, housing discrimination in the city of, of uh, Evanston. So that, that, um, that process is one that is on the rise, I believe, around the country and local municipalities around the country. And that's that's why I'm so excited because those those reparations campaigns that rely on local municipal support are possible. I, I can see wins. There's actually a coalition of 12 cities that have already committed to doing reparations. I think St. Louis is in that group, the city of Detroit, and there are cities with black mayor, cities with progressive city councils that actually will move on this in a way that I don't know if we'll ever see on the federal level, to be blunt. <laughs> I support HR 40. But I just don't see the same political support on uh, the Hill, especially amongst, amongst the Senate that I could see on the local level. So I'm very excited about what could be happening locally around the country. And to be honest, I think that's the way it should be. I'm glad that local communities are stepping up and their voices are being heard in a way that would not be replicable if it was if we were waiting on Washington DC to, to, to sign a big bill for us. I'm glad that people are participating locally in the process of trying to get healing for their communities. And so that's, that's one of the most effective things I think we've done recently at the center. We had the pleasure not only of helping the city come up with its legal strategy, but even helping them fight off a possible challenge of the, on the constitutionality of reparations, <clears throat> where some some were arguing that it would be seen as similar to affirmative action and uh, perhaps unconstitutional because it would be a race-based provision of uh, money to people. But we we did realize even then, and we still believe now that when you have when you have evidence uncovered, when you have cities that are doing research into uh, the harms that took place, and they, the city acknowledges those harms. To have a remedy that's narrowly tailored to, to uh, provide redress for those specific harms, that, that, that remedy should survive any strict scrutiny analysis that would happen under the 14th Amendment. So I do believe local reparations is, it, it can be constitutional. Thank you. So I, I want to make sure that I save plenty of time for um, this amazing group that's joined us who may have questions that they have for you. But I, I guess I always, often think of, uh, you know, enter into clinic, you're thinking about your outcomes, the learning outcomes for the semester, and whether we hit them or don't hit them, I don't know. Um, but I, if you had one takeaway that you would want your clinic students to have at the end of the semester, what would that one takeaway be? You know, I struggle with this, you know, students take away so many different things that you never expected to see. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that ultimately I want them to 
understand that um, they can do so much more than just litigate to be good lawyers. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, you're a good lawyer does so much more in terms of constructing arguments and fighting to change the law outside of the courtroom than inside the courtroom. So that's really one of the things I want them to take away. Great, thank you for that. So um, uh, Dean Harris, why don't we go ahead and open it up for questions, um, conversations with clinicians. I don't wanna be the one who hogs all the conversation. So I do want, um, and you know, so great to see. Um, May, I must, I also must feel I have to give a shout out to May Quinn because Professor Quinn has been very supportive in my journey into attempting to uh, take on the Youth Justice Clinic when she moved on. Um, I have not even come close to filling her shoes, but I just wanna also recognize the work that she's done in this space as well. So, thank you. And everybody, if you would like to join us on camera for the Q&A, it's nice to feel like we're actually in a room together. So please do if you're comfortable. If you wanna just stay off camera, that's fine too. Um, I definitely have a question, but let's open it up to anybody else who may. And you can use the little hand raising function on Zoom if that's easy, or you can raise your physical hand if you're on camera and we'll see you. So I'll ask the first question while well, people- We can wait, we can wait, we can wait, we can wait, Dean Harris. We can okay. wait, we can wait. unless you want to jump in, but I, I have no problem with waiting. So I, I do have a question that I think might be of interest to everybody here. Um, so I think, Professor Hansford, you know, when the work you're doing is so huge, you're wrestling with such systemic, important issues. This is kind of the age old question when you're doing anything other than, than direct representation work, or, or even when you're doing direct rep work on a, on a longer timeline. Um, how do you think through uh, creating meaningful kind of, you know, semester length um, chunks of work for students to do? And as a second piece of that, how do you approach talking through the feelings students may have when the reality of the work doesn't permit that? I would just love to hear your take on, on that issue. Yeah, that's those two good issues. I have a weekly reflection paper I give to students. And I encourage them to talk through some of their uh, issues, questions, you know, processing what took place over the course of the, the week in those reflection papers that I always respond to. Um, in our, you know, when I um, you we use Slack <clears throat> for communication, so I can respond to them online. That helps a lot because it's, I have 13 students in my clinic. It's very difficult to find time to help them effectively process emotions you know, in the in the day to day work, so much is on your plate. So uh, that I found has been a good way to get, help them process uh, what's happening on uh, the question of finding bite sized projects. That's really a real challenge, as you can imagine. I don't know if I've solved that that challenge. I this semester I actually had students participate in uh, coming up with the retainers for their clients, and that was a um, a process that allowed them to see what it's like to determine what sort of work product is, is uh, deliverable within a short period of time of a semester and to understand that uh, the, the broader context of the campaign first before really determining the size of their work product. Uh, that, and I'm experience, experimenting with that. There have been pros and cons of that process, but I do think that it's been interesting to allow them to get to see that this, the inside, insider perspective on how we come up with projects for, for students during the course of the semester. Great, I think uh, Virgil had a question. Yeah, I was wondering if Professor Hansen could talk a little bit more, uh, if you could talk a little bit more about your faith and how that plays in. And, and is there an, a dynamic um, with, with students as well over that, either students of faith or different faith or no faith? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, for me it's Islam, but or I know for other students, and I'm not sure why there's music coming in the background. I apologize for that. But for students, you know, I think that we uh, do over the course of coming up with our uh, public narratives, uh, move, we do thought, talk about questions of um, uh, motivation, 
and uh, not only about their own motivation, but more so about motivating others to participate in the movement movements that we are seeking to advocate on behalf of. Um, and that 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 process is one in which we actually do study what types of uh, emotions, what types of uh, you know um, motivators lead people to get involved in trying to create change. Um, I do. I mean, it's, it's obviously it's, it's uh, you know we're, it's it's, it's uh, not easy to bring faith into the classroom uh, when you know people have all these different faiths. I, I respect everybody's faith, obviously, but I know uh, when people have a opportunity to to give narratives, I actually ask them to give pub, uh, narratives about their own life. I don't so we 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 ultimately want to teach them how to amplify the narratives of others. But in our classroom setting, we begin with with their own narrative of their own story. What brought them to our clinic? What motivates them to be involved in campaigns for social justice? Sometimes that involves their description of faith. Sometimes it involves family. That's another major motivator. Some people have had issues happen in their family that have really led them to want to fight against mass incarceration. We've had students who's, uh, you know, their fathers were incarcerated and they talked about the loneliness or, you know, the lack of connection they had. And so they want to fight mass incarceration because they don't want that to happen to someone else. You have students who, you know, parents didn't have an access to education. So they want to fight for education justice because they don't want other people to suffer the way their parents suffered not having, uh, you know, a college education. Um, so, you know, so that so some so there are different ways that students bring their their stories into the classroom through that process of, of uh, telling their story and learning how to tell their story in a way that resonates with an audience um, and that communicates values and that involves a call to action, a call to action at the end. So that those are some of the ways that we engage people's narratives and stories uh, in our in our instruction. Other questions or comments? Sh Shama. Um, hello, thank you very much everybody for this wonderful opportunity. I'm really appreciating the very authentic and heartfelt sharing of journeys. Um, Professor, I was wondering, um, so we, I teach at a university that I would, that is my alma mater and I would characterize it as um, much of the student body is coming from a lot more privilege than the community we live in. Um, you know, of course, we have a diverse student body and people come from different backgrounds, but the reality is that they're, you know, on the most, for the most part, better off than the folks around them. Um, and while we're moving towards movement lawyering and engaging in the community, what advice would you have to remind our students, because we already engage in, in some preparation that, hey, you are not people savior. This is client-centered litigation that we're teaching, right? We're not people savior. So don't think you're gonna come in and save the day. And I also inject my own thing is that the law never really solved anything. It's always people that solve problems, right? But if you're taking it a step forward to really engage in the community, what advice would you give to students that you've learned over time that helps center them in a way that starts them off on that process of you're not saving people, you're you're supporting the work that's already being done? Thank you for that question. And this this actually may have to be my last question. I'm, they're they're uh, transitioning to another. So I have some logistical issues that may cause me to have to break off a little bit early. I have to apologize for that. But. But I do, but yeah, I think for my for my students, I think there are some keys to remember that the focus is on the clients and the focus is on the cause. I've had to have those discussions with students a couple of times. So the focus on yourself as superhero is not is not the focus that we um, acknowledge. And you know, I think that students are are in the clinic usually for the right reasons. Students decide to to work in something like a movement lawyering clinic because they do understand that ultimately that these campaigns are for a structural change that's bigger than them. And it's not about their own um, you know, superhero complex. 
But, um, you know, that that whole savior complex issue is one that is an ongoing issue. I think that the the um, the centering of the campaigns as the agents for change. So in these cases, you know, it's different from an individual representation oftentimes where I, a individual person may think through their lawyering tools, they can bring, you know, take someone off of the of, off of death roll, death, death row, or take someone, you know, and save them from eviction because you're part of a campaign that is re, that is led by the grassroots movements. It's a little bit easier to conceptualize the fact that if there's change that's going to happen, it's going to happen through a confluence of actors from people who are directly impacted, from people doing communications, from people protesting, from people drafting legislation, and so the, I think it's easier in the in the in the campaign context to avoid that sense of individual uh, super ego uh, because there's so many different actors working together and you can see that change is going to take place through collective collective uh, action not through individual action but through collective action so that's 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 a that's a advantage of doing movement lawyering as opposed to individual representation clinics where there's less of an emphasis on collective action. Well, we just want to thank you, Professor Hansford, because your time is incredibly valuable. And I know that we've gained a lot from you in the last hour. Um, we, we will stay on and engage you know, as a community. We're, we're ending talking about collective action. And I think that building community and connections is so important in that. So for anybody who would like to stay on, please do. And we can all kind of meet one another. Some of you know each other, some do not. Um, but thank you so much to both of our speakers today. We did record this conversation and we'll make it available on our website along with the three conversations we recorded last semester. And we will invite you back and I'll get some links in the chat if you if you stay on for a minute. Um, we'll invite you back to re-engage with us uh, just a couple weeks from now on October 21st. I will be in conversation with Stanford's Criminal Defense Clinic Director, Ron Tyler. He is going to be talking about secondary trauma and self-care. He just did an eight-week session for the Public Defender's Office in, in Northern California. And we'll be talking about that and about what he does in his clinic with his students on that topic. Um, and about how we move beyond that to community care. He'll also be talking about the power of vulnerability, um, as he calls it in black, white, and in color, because being vulnerable is different for different people, depending on your positionality and where you're coming from. Um, we're gonna round out this semester with Professor Chris Henning from Georgetown. And she will be in conversation with our new criminal law clinic director, Aisha Murphy. And they're gonna be talking about advocacy beyond clinic and a little bit of what has come up today too and kind of doing it all, right? And how do, how do you do that? How do you manage your time? Um, what do you say yes to? How do you engage? So I'll paste links to both of those events in the chat, but I will stop the recording so that things can be a little bit less informal and we can all engage as a community. Thank you all for being here today and do feel free to hop off if you need to.